Namo namaha. So now that we've learned about the idea of vowel strengthening, about gunas and vridhis, we can now start to get to uh, get cracking at uh, learning all the various rules of what we call external sandhi. This is, in other words, what happens when two words in a Sanskrit sentence uh, meet each other. Uh, euphonic combination in, in English. In the next four segments, we'll be looking first at vowel sandhi, then consonant sandhi, and then we'll have a segment on visarga sandhi. Our general strategy here should be like not to learn every single rule by heart, uh, but Kind of in the way that we were approached our consonant clusters in the Devanagari unit, if you remember, let's learn major patterns uh, by looking at some examples, keeping those in our head, and then getting familiar with uh, the specific Sunday rules as we encounter them in our readings. Uh, by the way, we uh, on the on our on the UBC Sanskrit website, uh, we've also provided an exhaustive reverse sandhi chart, uh, where you can look for possible clues for solving sandhi uh, and breaking apart uh, and finding the original underlying words. This is basically what you're eventually going to be doing with sandhi in as your uh, knowledge progresses. So on to vowel sandhi. By vowel sandhi, we mean what happens when a vowel comes at the end of a word and is followed by another, uh, e well, it's followed either by nothing or it's followed by another word that starts with a consonant or in the third case, a word that starts with another vowel. Let's look at each of these cases independently. In the, in the first case, this is going to be about as easy as, as it gets. Uh, when a word ends in a vowel, uh, this is the last word in a sentence uh, when, with, when the vowel is in what we call absolute final position, in other words, then nothing happens, in fact. Uh, there's no change to the vowel. There's no sandhi to take place. Great. <laughs> so far, so good. Let's look at case number two. Uh, this is when the word, uh, a vowel final word is now going to be uh, followed by a consonant initial word meaning a word that ends in a vowel comes before a word that starts with a consonant. Here too, in the vast majority of cases, we're in luck, nothing's going to happen. There's going to be no change and the words, the two words just sit as they are written separately and all is well. Uh, there's one exception. If the second word starts with the ch gara, uh, the palatal unvoiced aspirate, then there's a kind of gemination, this is what it's called, that takes place, where the ch turns into a cluster ch, uh, the ch and ch. The two words are still written separately here, but there's a half ch gara that's going to be attached to our ch gara. For example, if you had ramasya Chatram, meaning Rama's umbrella, there's a half ch uh, that's added to the ch, a half ch that's added to the ch, making it Rama Sya Chatram. That's going to be our second case. Our case three is where it's going to get tricky uh, when a word that ends in a vowel comes before another word that starts with a vowel. Different things are going to happen now depending on the identity of the first vowel. We're going to be calling this one V1 uh, and the second vowel, which are, we're going to call V2. V1 is the vowel that comes at the end of the first word, V1, uh, and the V2 is the vowel that starts the second word, V2. Easiest situation is when V1 and V2 are either the same vowel or they're the long and short versions of each other. Uh, that, the, the term for that is called homorganic in linguistics. So O and A are homorganic vowels. So are uh, E and E and U and U and R and R. Uh, L has no partner. The basic rule for homoorganic vowels is that uh, they coalesce or merge together to form the long version of that vowel. So if you had a, a word that ends in the short a, uh, followed by a word that starts with a short a, uh, they're going to fuse together to become the long a gara. Uh, same with a plus a, a plus a, a plus a, or a plus a. Right? Uh, an example is ma followed by astu, which becomes mastu. 
meaning let it not be so. Uh, the same rule is going to apply to long and short e, long and short u, long and short r. Uh, the two v- vowels are going to fuse together and turn into the long version of the vowel. And then the two words get smashed together and written as if they were one. So gachati plus iti would become gachatiti. And it's going to be written as one word. Guru followed by upeti would be written together as guru peti. It's hard to think of other situations where you're going to get two vocalic rs face to face because, in fact, vocalic r is almost never found as a word in the word final position. But if somehow it did happen, it was followed by another vocalic r, the two would coalesce together and turn into the long r. Pitr plus fa, which means father, followed by rushi, which means sage, in theory would become pitrushi. Uh, the second situation of vowel sandhis when the first vowel, the RV1, is a simple vowel except for a uh or a. Uh, other than a uh or a, uh. and then the second vowel v2 is any other vowel, simple or complex. In that case, our simple vowel is going to turn into its semi vowel equivalent. Remember, I made you learn those in the last segment. Uh, the equivalent of our long and short e is our y, the equivalent of long and short u is w, semi vowel equivalent of long and short vocalic r is the r, the r kara, and the vocalic l is the l kara. V2 then gets attached to that semi-vowel that you've created, and then the two are written together in Devanagari as if they were one word. So word final E or E would turn into the Y before any other vowel, and that vowel then would get attached onto that Y in its matra form, if you remember. Uh, for example, gachami, I go, followed by aham, I, mean, becomes gachamiyaham, meaning I uh, am going. Uh, if the 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 ikara changes to the ya, the word karoti followed by odanam, he makes rice. Then it would be written karoti odanam, where the ikara changes to the ya, uh, and then the vowel is represented as a matra that's attached right onto that ya. Uh, notice by the way that the devanagari words are going to be written together. Our iast uh, Roman transcription they get written separately. iast always tries to separate. The words, if possible, so that it's easier to find out where the word uh, starts and ends. Uh, our other examples of uh, semi-vowel transformation include Devi before Agachati, the goddess comes. This is going to turn into Devi with a Y, Agachati. The Ikara has changed into a Y. Uh, guru plus Adya, meaning do it today, uh, becomes Guru Vadya. Where the ukara has become a wakara. Guru plus asanam, meaning a heavy seat, becomes guru wasanam. Uh, so again, it's the, that, that's what's going to happen when a simple vowel is at the end of the first word, except for a uh or a, uh, and then it's followed by a, any uh, other vowel, uh, a word starting with any other vowel at all. So that means we have two more cases left over. One, when the word final vowel v1 is uh, or a, uh, and two when the v1 is a complex vowel. Let's look at these one at a time. So when v1 is a uh, or a, uh, one of three things is going to happen depending on what v2 is. Now remember, we get v1 is the the vowel at the end of the first word. V2 is the the vowel at the start of the second word. Now. If V2 is also a uh, or a, uh, we already know what's going to happen because they're homorganic vowels and they're going to coalesce and turn into, sm- they're going to smash together, turn into our long a, uh, and we're happy. Uh, mastu, right? We already know about that. Great. Now, if V1 is a uh, or a, uh, V2 is any simple vowel now besides a uh, or a, uh, meaning it's e or e, u or u, r or r, or r then our a uh and a uh is going to force the v2 to gunate, and then uh, the two words are going to be written together. They multiply and gunate, in other words. A uh plus a uh or e equals a, a uh plus u or u equals o, a uh plus r equals r, a uh plus r equals al. The same goes for a, uh, right? The two vowels are going to merge together to turn into the guna of that v2, and it's going to attach to that previous consonant in a matra. 
So if you have n followed by iti, it's going to become neti, meaning not that. If you have ramena followed by ukta, uktaha, it's going to be ramenoktaha. It was said by Rama. Uh, tava followed by rutam would become tavartam, your truth. Uh, one word of caution here is that the same transformation will happen whether uh, uh, V1 is lo short or long A. Uh, so with the vocalic R in particular, it could be kind of misleading. A uh, plus R is still going to be R. It's not going to be R. So Taya followed by Rutam would become Tayartam, not Tayartam. It feels a little bit off, but it's correct. Uh, so that's what happens when V2 is a simple vowel. Now when V2 is a complex vowel, meaning A, A, O, or O, then the A uh, or A uh is going to force that vowel to augment into its vridhi form. So Na followed by Eti uh, would become Naiti. He does not go. Uh, maha followed by Oshadihi becomes Mahaushadihi, the great medicine. Uh, Ramasya Aikyam becomes Ramasya Aikyam. Rama is solitude. They merge together. These are the various situations when V1 is A or A, and it's followed by a word initial vowel V2. Now, we've already looked at what happens when V1 is any other simple vowel. Uh, so the final situation we have left is when V1 is a complex vowel. Either one of the guna vowels, A or O, or one of the vridhi vowels, A and O. Now, if, if, it, if V1 is A, uh, and V2 is any other vowel except for a, uh, then a changes to a, uh, and V2 is going to remain unchanged, and the two words are written separately. Goldman has a pretty technical, but I think a very useful discussion behind the kind of mathematics uh, of how this transformation happens. It's worth reading carefully if you're interested in how the vowels break down into their parts and reconstitute themselves. But here we can just cling to a couple of examples, maybe. Rame uvacha would become Rama uvacha, meaning she spoke about Rama. Uh, notice how these words are written separately now, and the A looks like it's, um, uh, it doesn't, you can't tell that there's an A, right? Uh, V1, uh, if V1 is A and V2 is short, uh, then the A is not going to change, and the A uh of the V2 instead is going to be dropped. And it's going to become re represented by what's called the Abagraha. It's an S shape that's written without the top line, and which represents your missing A. Uh. Uh, the abagraha isn't pronounced, and it just sits there by itself. In IAST, it gets represented by an apostrophe. So te, followed by api, would result in the dropping of the a uh, and putting in the abagraha, and it becomes te pi, meaning they too. The vowel o very rarely occurs in the word final position, but if it does, and if the v2 is a, uh, it's going to follow that same pattern where the o remains unchanged and the a uh becomes dropped and replaced by your s avagraha, s shaped avagraha. So we could get guro plus api, and it would be guro pi. Um, if v2 is any other vowel, uh, then the o is going to change to of. And the vowel V2 will be written as a matra uh, attached to the vakara of of. So guru plus agachatu would become guravagachatu, meaning, I don't know, hey guru, please come. Again, this O ending word is very rare. Uh, you won't ever really see it. Uh, finally, we have our two vridhi vowels, ai and o, that are left over. When these are in the V1 position, uh, and are followed by a word with any vowel as a V2, then it's a very simple change that happens. Ai becomes a, and they're written as separate words. O becomes av, and they're written together. They're smashed together. So we get tasmai plus adadat would become tasma adadat. He gave it to him. Or if we get, uh, if we have ubho plus uwacha, it would become ubha uwacha. She told both of them. Uh, notice in, in, in this one, the words are going to be written together, while in the case of the ai, they were written apart. Let's take a break here, uh, review what we've learned, practice, do some of the exercises that are on the UBC Sanskrit website, and then once you're ready, we'll turn to our next topic, which is going to be consonant sandhi. Thank you for watching. See you in the next segment. Punar milamaha dhanyavadaha. <laughs>